A United States attorney deals with more than just federal crime, much more. I'll talk with United States Attorney William J. Elenfeld II right now on The Law Works. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Closed captioning for The Law Works is made possible by a grant from the Monongalia County Bar Association to support legal information and education for all West Virginians. The Law Works is made possible by major grants from the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General and from Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 which provides high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems as well as PC-based systems, and by a grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. state's attorney has a great many responsibilities, including running the federal government's law firm. My guest is the United States Attorney for the Northern District of West Virginia, William J. Elenfeld II. Bill, welcome back. Thanks for having me. I wanted to talk to you about the kinds of things that go on in your office. You, uh, I, I describe you as the federal government's law firm in the Northern District of West Virginia. How many lawyers do you have? Uh, approximately 20 attorneys and approximately 60 total staff members. Paralegals and clerical and that sort of thing. Yes, sir. What do you do? Well, one, we prosecute all the, the federal crimes that occur in the district. We also defend the United States if somebody sues the United States because they've slipped and fell at a post office. Uh, we also um, try and be community problem solvers and that comes from the Attorney General. When I first came on board he said look we're not just to prosecute people, lock them up and forget about them, we need to try and solve problems in the community and so we do a lot of outreach and that's it's a team effort. A lot of folks in the office uh, work together to try and figure out how do we uh, stop crime from occurring through some creative methods. Well, let's, let's talk about some of the creative methods first. What, what kinds of things are you doing? Well, the big thing we've been working on lately is something called Project Future, and it's a drug education and outreach program with young people, middle schoolers and high schoolers in the Northern District of West Virginia. Our plan is to go to each of our 32 counties and educate young people about the dangers of prescription pills and heroin and other illegal drugs. We've gotten in the past couple of months to thousands of students already in middle schools and high schools. And uh, it's not just guys in suits like me standing up in front of a room and telling people don't do drugs because I think the research shows that's really not going to be that effective. Kids don't like to be told what to do or what not to do. Uh, it's like a young person who's told don't touch the hot stove. Well, they might go ahead and touch it because they're curious or because they've been told not to. And or so just touch it a little bit. Right, and, and realize that it is pretty hot but they'll go ahead and do it. And so that's not our strategy. Our strategy is to affiliate with real people who have dealt with this issue and have been impacted by it either because they're a recovering drug addict or uh, perhaps they've lost a child to uh, a drug overdose. And so we've, we've partnered with a number of different people who we've gone out and found and brought in to go in and talk to students and we think it's had a great impact. So you're actually bringing in people who have been involved, who have tasted the downside of these activities. We are. We're bringing in, for example, a man from Columbus, Ohio, who grew up in West Virginia, who lost his son to a drug overdose just last year. It's still extremely raw to him. It, it's, it's like it happened yesterday. And he has decided his way of dealing with uh, his loss is to go out and talk to young people so that it doesn't happen to anybody else. He's got an organization called Tyler's Light. His son got hooked on pain pills because he was a, an outstanding college football player. He switched to heroin 
and then he overdosed and died. So he goes and talks to people, shows them pictures of his son, shows them pictures of other young people who have died uh, so that children understand if they do decide to go down that path, what could happen. One of the problems, and you just described it in your, your scenario, you said he was using pain pills and he switched to heroin. It's, it's not like you just wake up one morning and say, well, the pain pills have been great, I think I'll try some heroin. No, uh, most times folks switch from pain pills to heroin because they're no, no longer able to afford the pain pills. They become too expensive and they can't afford that habit anymore. And so somebody who they're associated with says, hey, try this, it's cheaper and it gives you some of the same effects. And so they'll, they'll try that and they realize, yeah, it does give me some of the same effects and it didn't cost me as much. But the, the problem with heroin that we found is it's, uh, it's much more deadly. Uh, you don't know what the purity is. Um, not that you can't die from pain pills, but the heroin uh, is much more unpredictable. At least pain pills are made by a pharmaceutical company somewhere, and, and there have been problems with them yes. and the way they distribute this stuff. But generally, you know what the product is. And usually the pills are labeled or the bottle or package it comes in is labeled, so you know what's in there. You know exactly what you're getting. You know the, the milligrams and, and, and what type of feeling you're going to get. People still die from that, but with the heroin, it's, it's made in Afghanistan or other countries. And, and most of the heroin we see here comes up from Mexico. It'll go up to Pittsburgh or Baltimore, then it comes back down to northern West Virginia. And the, the young people and, and, and older people are taking it as well, and they just don't know what they're getting when they put it into their bodies. So one, you mentioned the cost differential between pharmaceuticals and heroin. I don't know if, if you are aware of figures. Do you have any idea of what pain pills typically cost a, a person? Sure, it's typically a dollar a milligram. So if you buy an Oxy 30 on the street, a 30 milligram Oxy, you're gonna pay $30 roughly, maybe just, 35. Just for one pill? Yes. And heroin? $10 uh, perhaps uh, for um, more than you would, you would get uh, with that one pill. Uh, so it, it's much less expensive. And, and one thing that um, we, we have uh, we recently experienced in going to middle schools and high schools uh, just uh, recently um, from the time we're taping this show uh, we went to a middle school in northern West Virginia and as we were arriving to get set up uh, we learned that one of the eighth graders at the middle school had overdosed on pills that day and had just been taken in an ambulance to the hospital and it really struck us it struck me it struck our, our guest speaker and another uh, person from my office that wow, this message really needs to be uh, put out there. And um, the, the timing was just uh, incredible. An eighth grader. Yes. That would be 13, 14 years old probably. Correct. How young are these kids starting? I say these kids, our kids starting. Right. Um, I, I get the feeling that eighth grade is about a, a, as young as we're seeing. Uh, when we go and talk to middle schools, uh, we don't think it's really a problem with sixth graders and seventh graders, and we try and focus our message towards the seventh and eighth graders. But eighth grade seems to be right at that point in their lives where they're going to be put into situations where they're offered something on a Friday or Saturday night or offered something by a friend after school, and then you get into ninth, tenth, and eleventh, and and it's a, just a wide open, uh, wide open as far as the possibilities of what they might uh, encounter. And this stuff is everywhere. It is. I have had, I, I do a fair amount of federal criminal defense in, in drug cases, and I've had clients tell me just how incredibly easy it is. I, I've had judges ask, when you get out of prison, if you wanted to find drugs, how would you do it? And they give some of the, the most remarkably simple answers, such things as, I just walk in the old neighborhood and there'll be somebody on the street corner who sell it to me. It's that easy. It's also uh, young people who are getting into medicine cabinets uh, and taking pills from their parents and from their grandparents. Uh, in, in some areas, uh, real estate agents, uh, when they have open houses, advise their clients 
to clear out their medicine cabinets before they have the open house because uh, there's a, a scheme and a strategy out there to go in and pretend like you're interested in buying a home, distract the real estate agent, and then go uh, you know, with whoever you're with and, and, and go through the medicine cabinets and see what you can find. And, and these so, are not eighth graders doing that. No, these are adults. <laughs> but, uh, and so uh, th there are so many different ways that people are, are, are trying to get a hold of these pills. And then th the worst cases that we're seeing in, in the Northern District are robberies of pharmacies. Uh, we're seeing folks who are going in and holding up pharmacies and, and recently in Ohio County, unfortunately a pharmacist had to, to shoot and kill the person who was attempting to rob his pharmacy. And so uh, it's, it's really become uh, dangerous and, and very troubling. Well, you do other things besides drug prosecutions. What are some of the other things you're involved in? Uh, we have a public corruption hotline. Uh, and this just started uh, in April of 2012. We've got a phone number, we've got an email address, and we've received hundreds of tips about public corruption that people are aware of in their communities. Uh, and we work with the IRS and the FBI and the state police to investigate these tips that come in. This is another way to try and solve problems in the community. Doesn't always result in a criminal prosecution, but uh, there's gonna be a good number of these tips that we've received that will turn into criminal prosecutions. We're talking about the activities of the United States Attorney's Office. My guest is the United States Attorney for the Northern District of West Virginia, William J. Elenfeld II. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. We've mentioned the Northern District of West Virginia several times. There is a Southern District of West Virginia also who operates independently of what you do. You're both under the Department of Justice. Yes. Uh, Eric Holder is the Attorney General as we record this program and for the foreseeable future. Uh, Tell, tell me more about what you're doing in this, this uh, public corruption hotline. What, what is public corruption? Uh, it's when a public official uh, might take a bribe or a kickback for committing an official act, something they're required to do uh, as part of their job responsibilities. It could be uh, a state senator who takes some money uh, in order to place a vote to, to help someone or to help a, a business or an industry. Um, it could be someone who's misusing federal grant monies. Uh, there are cases that are public knowledge right now in the Northern District involving allegations that, that folks uh, misused federal grant monies. And so that's a form of it. Uh, th there are many different ways. It could be a small town mayor who's stealing money uh, from the, the public coffers. Uh, it, it could be much larger than that. So there's a wide range of, of possibilities. Well, and we have seen several cases of public money embezzlements uh, over the last couple of years in West Virginia and, and pretty much all over the state. Right. If, if I call you, and, and we do have a contact information for that, the uh, West Virginia Public Corruption Hotline telephone number is 555 WVA Feds, WVA FEDS, uh, or an email address of WVA FEDS, WVA Feds at USDOJ.gov, US Department of Justice, USDOA.gov. If I call you or send you an email, do you want to know who I am? Um, we like to know who you are, but you're not required to tell us. Uh, and, and our message says that. If you call in and you get the message, uh, it, it's always going to be a voicemail. You're never going to talk to someone live. Uh, you're advised that you don't have to leave your name or your contact information. If you want us to get back in touch with you, you should. And a lot of times people do want us to call them back. And so in the email or the phone call, uh, they will let us know who they are and uh, how we can get in touch with them. A lot of times in these cases, though, folks don't want to be identified, and that's fine, too. Uh, we don't need to know who you are uh, if you give us enough information to follow up on what you're concerned about. Well, I think my state senator's been bought off. Right. But I'm not going to tell you who I am. I'm not going to tell you why I think that. You're probably not going to be able to go anywhere with that. That's going to be tough. <laughs> and, and we would prefer you give us a little bit more information than that or a way to get in touch with you so we can see what you have. Maybe you have some documents. Maybe you have some proof. Sometimes we'll just get things in the regular mail. And, and sometimes people are more comfortable with just putting something in the mail, uh, including some documents, and say, take a look at it. And we don't know who they are, but sometimes that gets us moving in the right direction. Well, am I going to get in trouble if I report somebody? No. Just no. Are you going to tell them that I called? Not if you don't want us to. It's an anonymous tip line. 
Uh, now, depending upon your involvement, I mean, if you're actually somehow involved in it and, and we're going to actually try and prosecute it, then you could end up getting pulled in that way. But it is set up as an anonymous tip line where we don't want to know who you are unless you want us to know. Well, what if I, I look out my window and I, I see that the mayor of my town has a, a, one of the city's road crews over there fixing his driveway? Do you want to know about that? We do, but we have other agencies that we work with. Not everything that we're made aware of is something that would be appropriate for the U.S. Attorney's Office to prosecute. And so we've partnered with the State Ethics Commission down in Charleston. We've partnered with the Secretary of State's Office and other agencies. Maybe a county prosecutor would be uh, a, a person who would want to go ahead and prosecute something. So uh, we're, we collect information. We prosecute cases that we can. We refer the other ones out. We also get calls involving incidents in the Southern District and we contact our colleagues down there, uh, Mr. Goodwin's office, and tell them about something that was brought to our attention. Mr. Goodwin is the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of West Virginia. Yes, sir. So not everything is a federal crime. It's, I've got to tell you, sometimes it seems like there's a federal <laughs> law against everything, but not everything's a federal crime, but you pass it on to the, the appropriate unit. That's correct. You're also involved with natural resources. In fact, you've done some things just recently that resulted in uh, prosecutions of corporations. Yes, uh, we had a, an interesting case uh, that was recently resolved involving uh, an energy company that violated the Clean Water Act. And this company uh, came into federal court, pled guilty to three criminal violations of the Clean Water Act for basically taking a stream on a waterfall and covering it over and creating a road so that they could more easily access a natural gas drilling site. And so uh, citizens actually became aware of this, brought it to the attention of authorities, including the EPA. It was investigated, it was prosecuted, and resulted in guilty pleas, a substantial fine, and probation for the corporation. That result led us to realizing we needed to do a little bit more as far as communicating about these issues, and so we, we formed a watch group. What, what is probation for a corporation? That's a good question, and we, we received it several times when this, uh, we were going through that process. In this particular case, it involves allowing a federal probation officer to go on any drilling site that this company may have in the Northern District. It involves advising the probation officer and the U.S. Attorney's Office of any other environmental violations that they've committed during the past and for the next two years. It also involves letting us know of any SEC or Securities and Exchange Commission filings that they make. And so there's some rules in place and basically as long as they, they play by the rules during the next couple of years, then the probation will end and everything will be okay. So you're not trying to shut them down. You're not sending the corporation to prison or something like that. No, we can't do that and we don't want to do that. We don't want to, this is a terrific industry. I mean, the, the, uh, the natural gas industry is, is wonderful economically for northern West Virginia and other parts of this area. So that's not our, our intention. But because there's so much drilling, it does have sometimes an environmental impact. And it's my job to make sure that we still have clean water to drink and clean air to breathe for our generation and for future generations. Well, and there have been some prosecutions similarly in the coal industry, mm -hmm. uh, primarily, I think, in the southern district of West Virginia. I don't know that we've had anything up here recently. Right. Uh, about violations of mine safety laws and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So I see the suggestion every once in a while that uh, President Obama is trying to use the EPA to shut down uh, coal, oil, gas, mineral industries, extractive industries. That's not what you're doing. It's not. It's my opinion, and I think it's the opinion of the Department of Justice, that we can have both economic development and, and this great boom that we've seen but also protect the environment. And so, uh, and in fact, uh, we really don't have that many EPA agents that are out there looking at this stuff. That's why we created this watch group and we encourage the public to let us know about things they're seeing because a lot of this activity occurs off the beaten path. It occurs up on a ridge in Marshall County or, or somewhere out in a hollow somewhere that most people and particular agents aren't aware of. And so we rely upon citizens to let us know if they're seeing something that seems suspicious. We're talking about the activities of the United States Attorney's Office. My guest is the United States Attorney for the Northern District of West Virginia, William J. Elenfeld II. I'm Dan Ringer, and this is The Law Works. 
You recently got some money uh, through grants uh, or a grant to emphasize certain parts of your drug uh, work. What did you get? We're real excited about this. This just happened uh, a couple of months ago and throughout the entire country there were only five counties in the entire country that were designated as high intensity drug trafficking areas. Four of those counties were right here in the Northern District. One county was in Kentucky. Five counties nationwide, four in West Virginia. That's correct. We have 32 counties in the Northern District. Four of them have now been designated as high intensity drug trafficking areas. And what that means is that hundreds of thousands of dollars in federal funds will now come to the four northern panhandle counties, Hancock, Brook, Ohio, and Marshall, to assist the drug task forces that operate in that region. We have talked on a previous show about how time consuming these prosecutions can be of what I'll call drug rings. Is that a, a fair way to characterize them, or drug conspiracies? It is. You can spend thousands of hours and involve dozens of law enforcement officials from U.S. attorneys down to beat cops, I guess. Right. And you now have money to better do that. We do. In cases like you've just described, uh, these officers have to work sometimes around the clock. If there's a wiretap uh, where they're listening to people's calls or watching their text messages or doing other things like that, they have to watch that all the time. And it's expensive. And so you have a local police department that perhaps can't afford to pay the overtime that's needed to keep that person working. That's where this money comes in. It pays that officer's overtime. It also allows them to have buy money if they're going to try and buy drugs from a drug trafficker. It also allows them to buy equipment that they need, whether it's uh, audio or, or video surveillance equipment or trackers that you might place on a car uh, and things such as that. It gives them resources that aren't otherwise available to them. At least that sounds overblown. I was recently involved in a criminal case in a town in West Virginia where one of the witnesses was to be interviewed by the local police agency and I was trying to coordinate and, and set up the interview and I, I called the officer who wanted to do the interview and I said, well, I can have this person available anytime Monday through Friday between 1 and 5. And the answer I got back was, I can only do it between 1 in the morning and 7 in the morning because I'd be on overtime to conduct that interview and I can't get anybody to approve the overtime pay. So this small town police agency wanted to bring somebody out in the middle of the night to give a, a witness interview in a criminal case. And my point of view was no, this, this person is not going to be at his peak, not going to be able to do it. So this kind of money can avoid those circumstances. It can. Uh, it's a wonderful addition to this district and on top of providing funding it forces not that they weren't working together already but it, it brings these task forces together uh, to work more cohesively to deconflict better in other words to make sure they're not uh, trying to go after the same particular target uh, and put themselves or others at risk. Uh, it, it really brings everyone to the table. Uh, we create what's known as a steering committee. Uh, it's actually caused Marshall County to, to sort of revamp and reorganize its task force. Uh, the DEA is fully supportive of it. So what it's going to do is create more intelligence sharing and just overall better investigations. You brought up a term that we have never defined on this program. What's a drug task force? It's a group typically of federal, state, and local uh, law enforcement agencies that come together to work for a common goal, which is typically to go after drug traffickers. And a lot of times these task forces are labeled as drug and violent crime task forces. And so they'll also investigate homicides and other uh, serious violent crimes. And, and we have a number of them in the Northern District of West Virginia where you might have the DEA, a county sheriff's department, a local police department. And they all come together and work in the same office, share resources, and work together to investigate major drug traffickers. I, I have uh, seen a number of task force operations and I've, I've always felt that they were worthwhile because it gives your office and agencies like the DEA, the FBI, ATF, whatever's involved, an opportunity to educate the small town police officer in how these things are to be conducted, uh, the best ways to do certain things, by actually working on the job with them. 
Absolutely. Uh, the, the amount of knowledge that's shared, the, the expertise that perhaps a DEA agent, ha DEA agent has that he can share with uh, a new young police officer from a local department, uh, it's hard to place a value on that. And so, and it encourages cooperation. Well, and the reciprocal of that is the local officer knows the town. The names of the streets, which street corners people hang out on, that sort of thing. And they can convey that information back to the, the people from your uh, agency. Each of those officers brings something different to the table and they, they all work together and it makes for better investigations. And it avoids the situation where you show up at the drug bust, everybody pulls out their guns and they say, cop, 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 right. And you find they're arresting each other or that, trying to. That's why deconfliction <laughs> is so important. We don't want that to happen. Bill Eulenfeld, United States Attorney for the Northern District of West Virginia. Bill, thank you. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for being with us. On behalf of the Law Works, I'm Dan Ringer. Good evening. If you would like to suggest a topic for a future The Law Works show, or if you're a school teacher and would like to receive a DVD of this show for classroom use, send us an email to thelawworks at comcast.net or visit us on Facebook. On The Law Works website at thelawworks.org, you'll find a listing of recent The Law Works programs, additional information about this show's topic, and video of this and recent shows. You can also find The Law Works programs on YouTube and iTunes. The Law Works is produced in cooperation with the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General, the West Virginia Bar Foundation, the Mountain State Bar, the Monongalia County Bar Association, and the West Virginia University College of Law. The Law Works is made possible by major grants from the Office of the West Virginia Attorney General, and from Software Systems Incorporated, a West Virginia company established in 1975 which provides high-end support services, programming, and consulting for county government AS400 mid-range computer systems as well as PC-based systems, and by a grant from the West Virginia Bar Foundation. The West Virginia Bar Foundation, the philanthropic organization for West Virginia's legal profession and justice system, promoting public knowledge of the law in West Virginia. Additional support for the Law Works is provided by the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals. From West Virginia Public Broadcasting.